Uh, welcome to the session that is, um, as you already know and can see, women-oriented. <laughs> Women and uh, social activism in the new media era. So I don't need to tell any of you that the world is changing. It is very rapidly changing at an unprecedented pace. And a lot of that has to do with the media, and in particular, the new media, which um, doesn't allow for the kind of uh, preparations that were once possible in the world. And one has to respond accordingly. In fact, the new media also responds accordingly and is so therefore constantly fluid. Um, one of the things that you know I want to bring up with regard to the new media and of course being in Pakistan, I'm sure everybody's going to do that, is of course the example of Suhaib Atta, who uh, I won't say unwittingly because he takes a, a umbrage at that, but unknowingly treated the Abbottabad raid. <laughs> so um, the significance of uh, the new media cannot be ignored. And social activism is something that is also evolving as is the influence of the new media on it. For that, we've got this uh, wonderful panel right here. I'm going to um, make introductions, brief introductions to everyone. <clears throat> Sabine Mehmood is uh, the founder of a not-for-profit organization called Peace Niche, but we all know and love her for TQF, which is her brain uh, brainchild. It is a cafe, but it's also a space that encourages, cultivates, and nurtures thought, creativity, literature, and the arts, talent, and much fun all year round. She's been working with uh, digital technology and the new media since she was uh, 15, and uh, when it really was the new media. Sabine has been an activist for over 20 years, having posted a photograph of herself from 1990 recently, you know, presenting that as proof. And she has an anecdote to go along with it, which I'm going to ask her to share with us. So she believes that if you want change, you have to make it happen, and you must keep at it to make it possible. John Adam, oh, I'm sorry, Sarah <laughs> Sabine. Uh, no, of course, she's always visible. Sana Salim is the co-founder of Gawahi.com, a site that aims to archive digital stories of abuse, survival, and resistance. See how that trips off my tongue, because you all know why. <laughs> it's a... Full disclosure, you should say why. Because I am a co-founder of Gawahi.com. It is a crowdsourced website that launched a few months ago, but has been nominated for an award. I'm saying all of this to Sana Salim's credit. And has been covered extensively in the national and international online print and broadcast media. Sana made her mark in the online world with her blog, Mystified Justice, Global Voices, and Dawn.com blog, where she writes hard-hitting, critical opinion pieces. As a blogger, she has been on television in Pakistan and the world to talk about the need for ordinary citizens to speak out. And that is also the agenda of Gabani.com. Jan Ara is the president of the Pakistan Software Houses Association. Many of us have uh, listed Jan Ara in our contacts list as Jan Ara Pasha. <laughs> so synonymous is she with the Pakistan Software Houses Association. And so alive is the entity Pasha. Um, because of her work with it. Jana's association with the online world is uh, extensive, but her work with online activism has been creating a buzz lately, uh, especially for the last couple of years. Along with a few others, Jahan has been part of a campaign called Take Back the Tech, an online activism initiative that argues that the internet is a space where women are harassed and need security as are most spaces in this world. Rebecca Chow is the co-founder and director of the widely acclaimed initiative Harass Map, a project based in Cairo, which since December 2010 has been giving women an outlet to report instances um, of harassment. The site works in Arabic and in English with exposure to sexual harassment, which led to the idea of Harassment. So before we, um, in, before I start putting questions to you, Rebecca, if you would like to make a short um, introduction, tell us a little bit about yourself and your sure. work. Hi, <laughs> welcome, and welcome to the men as well. Um, you're a very important part of our our movement, so thank you. Um, 
and uh, just to give you a, a brief introduction to harassment, it's a bit of a, a long story, but it's a, a, a personal one. Of it. Um, we started harassment because we were tired of waiting for someone else to do something for us. <laughs> My friends and I, we used to work in women's NGOs and we worked on the issue of sexual harassment since around 2005. And a lot of the, the NGOs, the women's NGOs, started to work on this issue and the government and police and it gained a lot of, of popularity. But um, everyone was focused on advocacy and advocacy is great and a new law is great. but. Um, it, it wasn't showing any change when we walked out of the door in our daily life, on the streets, trying to get stuff done <laughs> every day. So um, instead of complaining among each other, which is what we were doing, uh, we decided to try to start something, you know, just ourselves. We all have full-time jobs. We're all just kind of normal people, and we do this as a volunteer initiative. We have no legal structure, we have no funding, um, so we're still learning and it's still a bit rough and we're still growing. So the way that we initially envisioned it is to use this uh, Frontline SMS and Yushihidi technology to be able to reach out to a huge number of people that normal NGOs can't reach. Uh, with traditional methods, you know, trainings and conferences, it only reaches a certain percentage of the population that's pretty small. But right now, Egypt's mobile phone uh, penetration rate is something like 76 million out of a population of 86 million, or 80 million, sorry. Wow. So uh, it's, it's extremely high. And so uh, using this technology, we're able to potentially reach a huge segment of the population. And about 50% of these are women, by the way. Um, and it's growing every year. <laughs> And the technology, the smartphone technology, is giving even more people access to the internet than the statistics say. By SMS, by the web, by email, Twitter, Facebook, basically any way they can. And each report gives a response with a referral to services. So there are NGOs that give free services like legal aid, how to make a police report, um, psychological counseling, self-defense, and no one knows about them. <laughs> They're great services, no one knows. So we respond to each report with a, a referral number. Then we map each report, uh, and this map makes it very easy to understand the problem, to highlight the, the reality of the situation uh, without anyone having to read anything. Uh, and if they want, they can click on the dots and read the text of the reports, which are SMSs, so it's pretty short and uh, has a big impact on people because it's also <coughs> sense when people are harassed. So they're kind of angry. <laughs> so it, the, the reports are kind of uh, dramatic. Um, then we use the, the map to identify areas to do community outreach. We didn't want this to be a purely online initiative. Um, we wanted to interact with people uh, as neighbors, as you know, members of the community. So we take the areas with high harassment and we go to them and ask people to be watchful against harassment and to speak out against the harasser. So this addresses our two biggest problems that everyone ignores harassment and that uh, people criticize the victim rather than the harasser. And this is against Egyptian tradition and Egyptian culture. So it's, it's been actually pretty successful and we've had a lot of demand uh, to expand outside of Cairo, to expand globally, to start research projects based on our crowdsourcing, um, and uh, work with a lot of these new post-revolutionary groups on you know, building outreach in different areas. So it, it's really exciting, but um, I'm hoping to learn from my fellow panelists and all of you, uh, because we're, we're struggling administratively to meet these needs right now. Um, so it would be great to share ideas and hear your feedback. Yeah, I'd like to expand a little on, on what you said about um, what I do, because I don't like to be sort of take into Pasha alone, and uh, although I know that, you know, that's the major time that I'm supposed to be spending on um, anything. But um, um, as I've always said, uh, whenever I attend any civil rights or human rights uh, 
event uh, or group discussion that don't look at me as a business person because sometimes I feel I'm the enemy. Uh, business people are also individuals and sometimes they're women, sometimes they're men. They're also people with a lot of ideas. Uh, they're passionate about a lot of things. And so I like to be seen as holistically as possible. And what I'm passionate about is um, a lot of things, and one of them is Take Back the Tech, which is basically an initiative uh, that many of us became a part of. Sana, Sadini, Naveen's been part of it, Faria here, Jamal. Uh, yes, there are men in, uh, who are part of this initiative as well. And the idea is to harness technology to try and end violence against women. So violence is a very broad term, uh, which includes harassment, both online and offline and to try and use technology to empower women. So this includes NGOs who are already working in the uh, space of women activism and women support who actually don't know how to use technology to uh, connect with each other and try and support each other. Uh, also to try and spread the word regarding the kind of harassment that's taking place um, now with new technologies and new forms of harassment. Um, and how to protect yourself online from those and not allow that to sort of isolate women from all this new media that is taking place. Because what tends to happen, especially in countries like Pakistan, where women are already told you can't do this or can't do that or you're not capable of doing this, as soon as something bad happens, uh, using technology, uh, many brothers, fathers, husbands, you name it, any male relative says, oh, you know, this technology is dangerous, women should not be allowed there. And so, you know, my sister, my daughter, so-and-so cannot be exposed to this because she's in danger, I need to protect her. And that keeps us away from the positive aspects, which is education, which is advocacy, which is connecting, networking, all that, which is what this entire thing is all about. So I'm very strong in trying to advocate for that, and I, many of us are, so uh, one can't do that in isolation. I also use it to uh, try and uh, crowdsource, as Rebecca said, for uh, against or for legislation that the government should be looking at. Or legislation that they have already sort of drafted, which doesn't keep in mind uh, the gender element, which doesn't keep in mind citizen rights, which doesn't keep in mind freedom of expression. And I think many of us, including Ali, has been involved in you know, advocating against uh, the prevention of electronic crimes ordinance, where we try and create an awareness as to what's wrong with it. You know, sometimes the, the, the normal person in quotation marks doesn't know that there are all these things that can be used against them by uh, law enforcement who are there actually to protect us, but sometimes it's not the way that it happens. So those are things, and then, Last but not least, the privacy element. With technology sort of becoming all pervasive, how are we going to ensure that the privacy of each individual, whether it be man, woman, or child, is maintained? How can we maintain it? How can we make sure that large organizations like telecom operators, banks, government, doesn't sort of have access to everything we do, that we are not sort of monitored and kept under this uh, lens the entire time. How are we going to ascertain that? So these are things that I'm very passionate about and I hope we can all discuss this. And There's so many of you here who are doing some amazing things, uh, both online and offline, and I think if we can, if I'm sure Naveen will try and keep it interactive so we can learn from you as well. Sana, I'll, uh, I'll direct a question to you okay. since you yeah. So many people say that uh, the recent movements in uh, the Arab world were not brought about by the 5% who were agitating on, uh, online, but in fact, the countless who actually came out on the streets. Um, now, as an activist who works mostly um, online, how would you respond to that? Do you think that it would have been possible for those countless to come out on the streets, or do you think it's in fact all in the streets? Um, I do agree with the I do agree with the notion that if it, it weren't for people going out in the streets and actually uh, being in Tahrir Square and making their presence felt, it wouldn't have happened. And I'd just like to um, elaborate a little bit on this. I do find the whole concept of social media revolution a little disturbing. 
because although I do use social media uh, rigorously for my activism, I do think that it is just a tool. It is a tool that allows you to amplify what you're doing. It allows you to reach out. So it extends your reach. It is supposed to facilitate activism. And activism without it would just be what they call collectivism or slacktivism, mm -hmm. which is, of course, um, me behind the safety of my screen talking about things where other people on ground are suffering. So um, yes, definitely, if the, it wasn't for people in there, it were millions of them making their presence felt. But at the same time, if it was at the time of media crackdown, if it wasn't for Twitter, we wouldn't know that these million people were out there. And it, we wouldn't, those visuals and those, um, those sentiments that we were able to share or relate to them, we wouldn't have been able to do it if it wasn't for social media. News would have come out, but we wouldn't have been able to relate to these, those people. We know these names now. We know Golem, we know Ala, we know Manal. We know them by their name, and we know when they suffered. We know when they were arrested. And we were worried, and we were bothered. We wouldn't have been able to do that person-to-person -person connection had there not been social network outreach. So it works both ways, I think. That's, it's a, you need to keep a balance, perfect balance. Sabina, can I, I yes. have a counter question? Yeah. Yeah. Am I allowed? Yeah. Or maybe just open it up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I've been wondering about this technology is just a tool uh, business for a while. And you know, there was a time when I used to argue that technology is a tool that's not an answer to everything. But now I feel that, so just a, a thought that to think about what social media is doing to cognition, to attention, to imagination. I think it's no longer a tool. I think it's shaping society. So just wondering what you think about that. I do I do agree with that. But uh, I, I would still just say that, yes, I agree with what you're saying. It's a powerful tool which is being used. But I just think that when we are, like, I have what I was saying, that I have a problem of over-glorifying it, I do agree that it's extremely, extremely important, and I'm not undermining. But we can't undermine on street activism. Oh, no, no, not at so all. So my question was more to more towards the balancing. Uh, very intertwined in, in the yeah. fabric of society today. I do agree with Shaping that. things, it is rather than just being yeah. a tool that you yeah. use yeah. to yeah. 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 That's yeah. right, isn't it? Okay. Okay. So do you, in that respect, Sabina, I'll ask you the same question. Sabina, I'm not sure your mic is on. Yeah. Oh, it is on. It is, but it's, it's kind of low. low. Very low. Um, and Sabine certainly is a low. So would, would you say that um, online activism or social media are in fact um, the harbingers of, of change or they are, are they? The, the I think leaders? being political is, is a catalyst for change. And you know, so, uh, so lately I've been thinking a lot about, about politics and what it means to be political. And unfortunately, this, this term uh, like anarchism and many other words have been uh, taken over by corporate media, by uh, by corporations, and and are just and politicians, especially the word politics. So it's it's become a, a really dirty word, especially in Pakistan. And and to me, being political is not about running for president. It's about believing in something and running with an idea that you can own. Um, we we use it as a, as a tool um, for kind of gathering information on which we act. So uh, it's, it's very easy to kind of spread the information and uh, to make plans and use it as a, as a vehicle. But we go door to door as well. Um, neighborhood by neighborhood, it's really slow. <laughs> we, we don't have expectations of quick change. Um, and, uh, and like I said, in, in Egypt, like the, the access is growing. So you know, we do what we can. But we use the tools that we can, and maybe they're not ideal. Uh, maybe there's a, there's probably a lot of people that can't afford an SMS. And ideally, it would be great if you know we had the ability to subsidize this, this cost. Um, but but we don't, and we, we try not to let these things stop us. We just try to use as many channels as possible, and social media, and online stuff, <laughs> digital stuff. Um, it's. It's a tool, and uh, it reaches a certain population, and we encourage these people to take it outside of online. We encourage them to come out, come to uh, a community outreach day, 
gets trained, mobilize people in their communities, and start community outreach days in their neighborhoods as well, uh, and reach people who maybe aren't going to Christmas.org or, <laughs> or sending a report. And, and you find that both women and men are, it's not just women who are responding. How, how does that happen? 50% of our volunteers are men. Um, and we also have two reports from men. So it's not that many, but um, it's the first time this has happened. So we're excited about it because for, we haven't been talking about sexual harassment in Egypt for a long time. It's only been a couple of years. And, but all the research that's been done focuses on women as the, as the exclusive victims and men as the exclusive perpetrators. But what we're finding, uh, we think probably because of the crowdsourcing mechanism, you know, the anonymity and the openness of it, that men are also speaking up. And a lot of the, the volunteers, even though they didn't make reports, they came to us personally and told us their stories about being harassed. So it's, um, it's not limited to women, like we thought it was. Uh, and you know, there's men that have personal experiences, and then there's, there's men who just you know, want to be proud of their society and feel like the women in their lives are safe as well. Um, and we find actually that they're the most influential volunteers. I hate to say it as a woman, but um, when they speak, people listen. And when we speak, people think we're hysterical. So it's good to have both sides, you know, the people that experience it most and the people who are, unfortunately, taken more seriously. Okay. Um, so, Jahan, when, when we talk about safety and security and so on, you and I were recently giving that uh, television interview where, um, you know, we were asked about security and so on. And, um, you know, I became interpolated and I was like, no, no, the internet is perfectly fine. Everybody should be on it and it shouldn't be exclusive to, or, you know, to men or that women should not be on it. Um, as it is, women are disappearing from, you know, public spheres. And if so, this is, this is a platform which is public and is open to women or more accessible than it should be encouraged. But would you say that the internet is a public space? Oh yeah, I think there's no debate about that. I think the internet has allowed women uh, a voice, which perhaps many of them didn't have. There were some women who have always been vocal in the public space, whether they were discouraged or not, because they were brave enough, but not all of us are brave enough. So the internet has allowed that, and more than that, it has allowed collaboration and discourse amongst women all around the world, and amongst women and men. and. It has allowed us to express what we feel and sometimes change our viewpoint if somebody else makes a better sort of uh, suggestion or says something that is actually totally against some belief that we held for a long, long time. And I think that has not happened before because I'm very active in the um, social media space, Facebook, Twitter, my own blog, and sometimes uh, when I put up a status message on Facebook, for instance, some young person from somewhere in Pakistan says, oh, I disagree with you, and I'm totally disappointed in you, and how could you have said that, madam? <laughs> or when he says madam, or that already throws me for a loop, but nonetheless. <laughs> but I have then the opportunity to respond to him or her on Facebook and explain my point of view, and actually have a discourse there, although I may not have ever met them. And that allows me the opportunity to actually do that. And I think more and more uh, girls, women, men are being able to do that. OK, some people are misusing the space. That they've been doing with the public space in any case. So I mean, I think it's, it's a great opportunity for learning. It's a great opportunity for collaboration. It's a great opportunity to express your point of view. It's a great opportunity to change the image of uh, you know, yourself, change the image of your country, your industry, whatever it is that you do. And uh, that makes it very powerful. So I tend to agree with, with Sabine that it's not just a tool anymore. It is an influencer, it's a, it's a space that has become available just like 
cafes in the old times and people who can use both, like Sabine's T2F does, uh, that creates for something really amazing. I'm, I'm going to ask Sabine, actually, I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, Jahan said that uh, she, she made a reference to, uh, to you and so on, and also saying that it gives us the opportunity, or Pakistanis the opportunity, to project Pakistan in a positive way. So, do you Naveen, think not just Pakistanis, because I've just returned from the World Islamic Economic Forum. I've heard women from Africa, women from the Middle East, and women from all over the world, including the UK, who are talking about being able to now voice things that they never put before. So it's not exclusive to Pakistan. Okay, to, to voice things in a particular way, but also for Pakistan, for the Pakistani blogosphere, isn't it true that there's a lot of pressure from within that you have to project Pakistan in a positive way, where, for instance, the, the international media, for instance, or even the mainstream media networks are not doing. So, but isn't it true also that citizen journalism came about and has gained strength all over the world because it was not following that kind of agenda and is meant to be hypercritical, in fact. So first, I just want to say something about something you haven't asked, which is the whole, you know, I have to admit I get really aggravated when people will always bring up this issue of if you're working uh, in the internet space or using the internet for your work, you'll be like, oh, but you know, you don't, re you can't reach that many people, and you're alienating people, and everyone doesn't have access. And I think this this needs to be turned on its head, and we need to challenge the people who ask these questions. So, okay, so what can we do to enable that access, and how can we get? computers or, or mobile phones into the hands of people who don't have them, what kind of tools and technology can we build that will, will enable more and more people to engage and interact and be part of this global, so-called global community. That's just laughing. Uh, as far as the image of Pakistan is concerned, you know, that has never been my concern. Uh, something that Rebecca said, um, really struck me about, you know, so, so people will sit around and complain and say, you know, that this isn't happening, that isn't happening, there's this problem, there's that problem. Now, one individual, one organization, one institution cannot take on the responsibility of changing the image or every problem that a, that a community or a city or a country face. But again, you can take, you can take your piece and run with it and do something about it. And if everyone started thinking that way, that you you come up with small campaigns that you, you know, create winnable <coughs> campaigns that give you a sense of um, accomplishment, that you've been able to do something, it gives you the momentum and the, the empowerment to do more. Uh, so that's important, and as far as the image is concerned, I think, you know, we need to worry about, it's like brands, right? So, so great brands um, are built on top of great products and ideas, and so, I think that, so I'm only concerned with building a great product uh, in whatever little way I can, whatever I've chosen to do. Um, and I think the image eventually will take care of itself. It's, you, you know, you can't put a wrapper on top of things and say, you know, yeah, look at me, I'm so cool, I'm so clever, I've done this. That image is going to take care of itself eventually. But we need to strengthen the product. And if people are concerned about how Pakistan is being uh, viewed, in the international media, well, do something about it. You know, if you want to write, go ahead and write. You now have, I mean, the great thing about blogging, I started blogging in 2003, and uh, I don't blog much anymore. Again, uh, post MTV generation, limited attention span, the world is jumping from one thing to another. It's the truth. Um, you know, you so, so freedom of the press belongs to those who own one. We own the internet. It's the most democratizing space there is. And any government that tries to control and curb our access gets tiny very quickly. I mean, before they can put a ban on something, people would have figured out ways to bypass that ban. So that's incredible. That's, that's uh, super cool. So um, I think we just need to get out there and, and use the tools that we have to say whatever we have to instead of whining and complaining. And, and I think the harassment is a great example. It's like, okay, you know, uh, there's a problem. Here's a solution. Today, these tools are available. I mean, I've been working in technology since I was 15. And there was a time when we had to build these things from scratch. We used to, you know, any volunteer work, like Dr. Iqbal and his website that I worked on many years ago, I had to bribe people in my office to stay back nights to build that. We built a content management system. Today you have WordPress, you have 
uh, Joomla, you have Drupal, you have everything under the sun to be, and, and all these APIs that are, that are open-ended, like Google Maps allows you to build on top of it, and you can create incredible powerful tools uh, to, to connect people, and so there's no excuse to whine and complain anymore. I can see that Ali Chishti has a, a question, but before it, before you ask your question, I just want to say the same thing to you, Sana, because you are hypercritical. You have a critique on everybody, here <laughs> and, and outside, oh. which, is, which is I think which I think is great. So, how would you how would you respond? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, that uh, citizen journalism should be hypercritical, or it should be building a brand, such as, for instance, Shining India. You know, they they built a brand. So like that, should there be brand building and should that become part of the new media's activities in Pakistan and social activism? No, I would, I would agree with uh, Sidney on the most part. I think she, she put it out there really well. I think that uh, you're right in saying that we are very hypercritical. But, uh, and I also, I've also seen that a lot of um, citizen media generated content has been affected by this trend of branding which has sort of killed, uh, for me at least, I would say, but it has killed the kind of things that you would, like the kind of attraction that you would find in citizen media because the point about citizen-generated content is that most of it would be without bias or political affiliation. It's opinion of the people and you, you're seeing various variety of opinions, it's diversity. Uh, but a lot of um, citizen journalists have now sort of become uh, replicas of mainstream media, like we see on Twitter, everybody's sort of breaking the news, and you will see the same thing going on and on and on throughout our week. We can see that on mainstream, but on one hand, it's very important because a lot of times, and, and majority of the times for me, I see my breaking news on Twitter, and a lot, and it's a lot for a lot of us too, but uh, that also includes sensationalism, which has become a part of citizen media now. And it's much more harder to counter that because there are too many people. You can't, like with sources, you can say, oh, there's a source by Geo or Don, but with that, you can't. So I don't think that there should be uh, branding at all. Of course, there's you know, like various campaigns that are working for something, the movements and all that, but I, don't, I really don't think that it should be completely able to go and no branding at all. Ali? Yes, uh, one of the topics we can discuss is about electronic harassment. Uh, as a parent, that's a very important thing which I've actually, you know, I've been online since the chalk days and uh, since 97, been as in. Um, one of the examples I would like to give is, you know, uh, something happened to Sana once, was apparently a lush Kareta Yama guy on, uh, <laughs> on Twitter who, you know, uh, who was harassing her. And apparently there's no mechanism in Pakistan as such. To solve these issues. And she you came to the rescue. Yeah, I came to the rescue with the guy to come and say sorry to her. Right? But but the thing is, uh, why do you guys, especially you know, from you know, the woman has to go to uh, you know individuals and seek help, uh, help them, but there's no mechanism. I think uh, uh, you know, uh, Jahara is sitting there. Of course, there's something called the e-policing network, which the said police has just set up. Um, just a suggestion that me, Jahara, and Sabine could work in this, that we could go and, you know, uh, like uh, we just set up, you know, Salim Shahzad was a friend of mine, and we just uh, made sure that somebody from the journalist community now sits there. So the, if somebody is harassed, uh, you can call the e-policing network, and there's somebody who would actually coordinate with the interior ministry or the local TV station. So just an idea that if we can all work together, we could have our own draft from Gawahi or EQF or somebody sitting at the e police if somebody is electronically arrested, which is now a problem now because uh, since the internet and the Twitter is so open and we could solve our problems. Well, I think we have a model right here. Yeah, yes, harassment, indeed. Which is all about harassment, right? But th that has to be linked with uh, a proper institution, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you can report it, but it doesn't. With, with problems like uh, things like harassment is that you make those websites but they don't, don't have coordination with the interior ministry. No, that's fair. Yeah. No, the problem is, he says, even when they have a report of cyber harassment of any sort, they can't do anything about it because no legislation exists right now. So he says, I can't do anything about it. But, you know, but, but we can uh, certainly sit down and discuss with the IT minister and the CCPO Karachi in terms of SIN especially 
but there's already e-policing which has been set up, right? This is for the purpose. Even if the FIA doesn't have the powers to, you know, do it, but at least, you know, there has to be a coordination of phone call from a, a headquarters on practical stuff would solve a lot of issues. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. yeah. Um, part of what we do is, uh, is raise the profile of this issue. Uh, this wasn't an issue that people could admit or talk about before. And once they started and it became more high profile, yeah. then the authorities started responding. So we don't have an e-police either. Um, we, we had no mechanism for phone harassment. Phone harassment is a big thing. Yes. <laughs> um, and Facebook and stuff like that. We've gotten reports of harassment via Facebook. And the first thing that people do is, uh, is they put all the identifying information on the report. So then it goes around. And we have a lot of hits on our website. So people get embarrassed. And it goes out over Twitter. And it's a small community still in Egypt. Like um, We have a large population. But everyone kind of knows everyone else. So when you put the, the name and the, you know, if, what the person did out in public, everyone knows and they get a reputation and they, it, it goes against them. But also, because um, harassment got a lot of attention or participation or whatever, um, the Ministry of Communication like, contacted us by Facebook <laughs> two weeks ago. And it, it used to be impossible to get a meeting with the minister, but the minister like requested that we meet with him to talk about things like this. And UN Women um, you know, wants to coordinate with the police. We don't have police right now, um, because after the revolution, they didn't really come back. So There's um, no police in Egypt? There's police in wealthy areas, um, but like as a systematic Wow. Yeah. Presence? No. Um, and I got, I, sorry, I also I need your Twitter ID because I'm live blogging and I need to get your Twitter ID. Oh, you can uh, you can do just harassment. At harassment. Okay. Um, so uh, so yeah, after the the public attention came, then the then the government came. So maybe what we're hoping is to work with the Ministry of Communications and you and women to get to like this protection, you know, get police on board, get like some kind of system built. So I think that really elucidates what I was hoping to say. That first you, so there's a model that exists, it's working. Uh, let's see if we can take, you know, work with them, see how we can build it here. And the, this example of the ministry contacting them is the way it should work here because then when you start making an impact and citizens actually, so you, you helped her out, right? Problem got solved. Yep. It's not institutionalized. That, that's yet. the problem. Right, but you can't, so, so there's some things that you can leapfrog. Yep. So Pakistan didn't get a computer revolution, but we leapfrog that whole thing and there's a mobile in everyone's hand. But there's some things you cannot leapfrog. Yep. You have to go through a process and you have to, you know, th this is something I think that will develop organically. So let's, let's first use the tools that we have. We have a resource. Uh, we have examples that we can follow. Because just going to someone and saying, oh, we need this. Well, there are many yeah, things exactly. we need that the state is not delivering. So I think let's see how citizens can bridge the gap and let it become a model, however small. Yeah, and I then see there's a small some. committee and I could chip in some money if you want to start something That's like that. Kind of there's there's so also, you know, the, the, you could always hook up with CPLC for instance. Yeah. I mean, where the state has they left a work. void in Pakistan, there has always been an alternative that has been created by the citizens. Yeah. So, <coughs> is that true? You, you know, so yeah. Hi, I'm Ahmed. I'm um, actually not a blogger, I'm a Twitter <coughs> user. Oh, hi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm following all of you, really. I'm, I'm following all of you, and uh, perhaps I, I, I'm the voice, of the citizen, right here. And I'm in this room just to ask one question. I follow all the female social activists, and I have a very simple question: Aren't you guys scared? <laughs> no. No. No? Uh, of, they make people scared. <laughs> scared. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, or are you as scared as a man would? I mean, is is there a difference uh, to the kind of risks that a woman uh, can have in Pakistan? I mean, um, uh, no, it, a woman can have perhaps uh, multiple more risks all over the world. It's not just in Pakistan. Uh, when we come come back late at night, uh, we obviously take care. Uh, you know, we have security or or somebody with us. 
But there are so many incidents with women. Doesn't it scare you to be so open-minded? I'd love to be one of you. I'd love to be one of you. Perhaps, honestly speaking, perhaps I don't have the guts of that, and I'm being very honest here. So how do you take care of that, uh, of that perhaps? There's no fear inside? 